He, uh, no, this time did a great job. He wasn't feeling well at all. And so what I thought we'd do is, uh, which is, I've been wanting to do this for a while, is just kind of a sermon of Q&A. And uh, I, I was wrestling with this because I don't want this to be something where you feel like it's a worthless part of your time. So ahead of time, I asked people to ask certain questions they might have. I brought up my phone here because it's got some notes. So what I want to do is I'm going to answer some questions that I receive from people um, in the next three hours we have together. And uh, Okay, two. Uh, and then we'll cover some of these things. And while I am answering some of the questions I've received on text and Facebook, if you have questions, if I were encouraging you, compose your thoughts. Do, that way you don't forget it. Write it down. And then uh, we'll have some time afterwards. We'll get as much cover. I won't give long, exhaustive. Pray for me. They don't give long, exhaustive answers. Pray for me. Uh, I know, bless him, Lord. Uh, we'll give short answers. So if you have questions later on, I'll just ask you right here on the fly what you have. So uh, so can I just start? I'll, I'll let your brain start at the blood flows. I'll start with some of these written down. Is that okay? Oh, okay. If not, we're still doing it. So I love you. Um, do, here, so here's a, two questions from the same person. Do Christians need to rededicate their lives if they have stumbled? Do Christians need to rededicate their lives if they have stumbled? Uh, the New Testament does not give us any indication that you need to do that. If a person has stumbled, I take that to mean, and I won't call on people because I, just in case you don't want to be known, that's fine. Uh, if by stumble you mean if you've sinned, the answer is no. You don't rededicate your life in the sense that you don't have to go through a whole process all over again and get rebaptized all over again. If by rededicate you mean, do I have to confess that to God and go, oh, God, I'm so very sorry, can we get our back on track? Yeah, I would do that. And the Greek or well, the English translation for that is confess. Like in 1 John 1, 9 when he says, uh, he writes, he says, little children, I write to you that you do not sin. But if you do sin, X, Y, Z. In John, 1 John 1, 9, he says, if you do sin, confess your sin. Well, praise God, we confess our sin. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So Christians are supposed to confess whenever we've sinned. Every time. The Greek word homologeo and confess means to say the same word. It's like you have a child like pulling out the teeth. Can you just say you did it? Did you eat the last cookie? Mm, and there's chocolate on your mouth. There's a little girl that came to a woman, a young woman in our church years ago, and I served at a Methodist church, and she, she was a cute little girl. She came up, mom was taking a bath. She told me the story. The girl came in, she had chocolate all over her mouth. Did you get mama's chocolate? I told she, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Like if she'll just say what actually happened, that's homologeo. Say the same thing of what happened in reality. Just confess it. And she wasn't mad. Just confess it. And that's what confession is. It's the same thing with God. So in my marriage with my wife, I don't get remarried every time. Well, hypothetically, if I ever failed her. Hypothetically. <laughs> if I ever were to do that, I don't. I'm kidding. Of course. Uh, I don't rededicate myself. Oh, Elaine, will you marry me? But do I confess it? Yeah. I blew it. I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry. So the marriage is not at stake a relationship off a little bit, perhaps? Yeah. But the right thing to do is confess it. Uh, if a person, I get this little side, little part B you didn't ask, but this is very common. If I've been, this is very common for people to, uh, say, to grow up in a church. Usually the parents kind of drug them there. They, maybe they meant it kind of. And then uh, seven out of ten high school students leave church when they're done with high school. Seven out of ten. Because they go off to college, they're out of their parents' regime, they'd stop going. Seven out of ten. I've read three independent studies that say that. Of the seven of the ten that leave, roughly three to four will come back. Roughly three to four, therefore, of every ten youth will never step foot in the church again. And the top two reasons, I'm getting way off. The top two reasons are because they go to college and think they have to choose between science and faith, which you don't. Or they, and they discover what's called pluralism. That is, their neighbor is a Wiccan and that other person's a Muslim. And I can't say they're going to hell. And then, therefore, they, they leave the faith. So if a per they usually they leave, they go wander off for a long time, live like a bunch of non-Christians, and then they get married, then they have children, and this little sense of guilt comes over, and I want my kids to have morals, so I'm going to drag them to church like I was drugged to church. They go to a church. I've met many, many families like this. What brought you back? Well, we've been away from the church for a long time. What brought you back now? I had kids, and I feel guilty. I'm going to go back. Then eventually God's spirit convicts them terribly and says, man, I need to get... When I hear the scripture and I hear oh, Jesus, he's right, or she's right, whoever they, whatever the church is. And they go, man, I, I realize I've blown it. I mean, I was way off. It wasn't like a little thing. I really blew it the last 15, 20, 30 years. Do I need to get rebaptized? To those people, I always say, I don't think you do. If you were a Christian earlier and you gave your life to Jesus, I don't think you need to start over. Hello? 
I don't think you need to start over. They've been gone to Florida. They don't need to start over. Uh, but if you did not give your life to Jesus when you were little, and all of a sudden now you need to, give your life to Jesus. But I have rebaptized people who feel like, no, I need to do this. Something tells me I need to do it again. I'll say to go for it. Uh, but every time you sinned, you got rebaptized? No, 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 no. Confess it. Receive his forgiveness. Stop doing it and move on. Done. Next. Some <laughs> uh, I can't ask, ask too many follow-up questions, or we won't get any questions. I'm sorry. If you have more follow-up, you can uh, talk to me. If you have any complaints, talk Bobby Thronebird <laughs> at gmail.com. She's not here. The second question is, some Christians believe that they, are, that they are to do works, to be saved. But in Ephesians, it states that you are saved by faith alone. The answer is that's exactly right. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that, that we are saved by, is a gift, right? We're saved by grace through faith. So it is true that uh, this is a long, detailed thing. Let me get this as short and simple as I can be. Um, uh, so in a Christian worldview, the, not just Ephesians, but throughout the New Testament, certainly Paul's writings, the Christianity teaches that a person, um, a person on their, as it were, natural state, for various reasons, are enemies of God. They don't do what God wants. They don't do what God wants. They are at, at odds with him. Their relationship is severed. It's not good. Some of you in this room are in that state right now. So in your natural state, as it were, you're, you're not friends with God, as it were. You, you're not. He's like a good idea, or you try to be a good person, or something like that. But he's, he's out, of, out there, either it's abstract, or you're kind of mad at him because someone died when you were a kid or whatever. But you're enemies with him. And then the Christianity teaches the only way to be reconciled in that relationship that you were meant to have is something that Jesus of Nazareth did for us on our behalf. And so the only way to be reconciled is something that Jesus did for us. It's like having a debt we could not pay for ourselves. I was so in debt with Visa, I would never in 30 lifetimes pay it off, and someone paid off my debt. It's like I was in prison all these years, and I couldn't get free, and he set me free. So the Christian worldview is that you cannot do something to reconcile relationship with God, it'd be cool if you could. So try it. And the odds are probably high that you are probably trying it. And what Christians are, a real Christian, is a, seriously, because I mean many, many people through the world who are skeptics, atheists, Christians, and they don't understand this. A real Christian is a person who fully gets it, uh, fully enough to say, huh, I am a broken sinner. I can't do it. You understand? I mean, Christian, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I just, I, we kind of, we come to the end of ourselves. We go, I'm over me. This ain't working. Christians get to that point and go, now what do I do? And Jesus says, praise me. Wonderful. You get it. Come to me. Surrender to me, and I'll make you new. So in that sense, correct. Uh, Christianity is not a religion where you have to be a good person and then get somewhere. Muslims teach that. You don't be mad about it. I'm saying that I've taught, I've taught at a college for a while. I've taught world religions. Islam teaches that. Islam teaches there's no concept of grace in that sense, in the Christian sense. You have to earn your way. Certain Jews hold the view you've got to earn. And that's a different, it's complicated. Uh, but historical Christianity teaches you don't earn anything. That's good news. That's good news. Is it true that what you do matters? Yes. Yes. And this is where a lot of Protestants like us get upset when I start talking about what you do. What's he going to say? So what I do doesn't save me, but what I do demonstrates I'm saved. So if I look at your life, oh, that's a bad analogy. You're going to think, David's a, I'm not being your judge. But in, you looked at my life. Johnny looks at my life and goes, David doesn't talk like a Christian, act like a Christian. Well, how do you know? Johnny's going to say, I've read the New Testament. I know basically what they should look like. He's judgmental. He never forgives. He never talks about God forgiving him. I mean, on and on and on. The odds are he's not a Christian. I'm not sure, but he probably isn't because he doesn't live like it. Well, how do you know his heart? John's going to say, because you'd see it. You'd see it. Uh, and James says it this way, faith without works is, it's dead. So you can say you believe something to your nose bleeds, but if you don't look like it, it doesn't matter. The analogy I give all the time is getting marriage. I wear a wedding ring. And I keep it on all the time, so it's when I work out in the gym. So I, this is my wedding ring to one person. I only have one. I don't have multiple rings to different people. One wedding ring. I sleep with one person named Elaine. I sleep in the same bed as Elaine. I pay my bills with Elaine. 
uh, I only bring one woman Diet Coke every day, morning, noon, and night. <laughs> Amen. Twice on Sundays. I go for a long time about that. Pray, bless the Lord Jesus. Only one, I could list a whole list. I only have children through one woman. None of those things that I do on purpose, consciously decisions, none of those things earn my marriage. I'm already married, but they sure show I'm married. And if I said I'm married to Elaine, you go, you? What do you mean you? I mean, y'all don't sleep in the same house. I mean, do you even hang out? Well, I know about her. She's, she's sweet. But that's not marriage. There's evidence. There's works that demonstrate I have consciously gone into a full-on commitment with one woman in particular. And so these are the signs. So in the Christian faith, while, while what we do does not save us, it doesn't earn my marriage, it does matter that we behave like Christians so we are obeying what Jesus said. If you want to be my disciple, he didn't say just believe something. Be my disciple, you must deny your wills, pick up your cross, and follow me, Mark 8, 38. You've got to do something. Look like it. Look like me. Value like me. Talk like me. And that's the challenge to all of us at work or at home when you act and talk just like a non-Christian and say, oh, Jesus has changed my life. And look at your Facebook posts or the, ma- the language that comes out of your mouth. If you look and act and smell just like a non-Christian but say, oh, he's, but he's a Christian. I love, I, the even, normal non-Christians see that and go, that's just ridiculous. I mean, that's, there's a word for that called hypocrite, or hypocrites means actor. Uh, well, David, I'm not perfect. Uh, right, you're right, Jesus is perfect. But if there's no manifestation of the faith you have, James would say, and I believe him, you, you don't have faith. You're just saying something, but you don't really believe it. Uh, I'll go to someone else. Someone asked, uh, when we are taken up in the rapture, what happens to our precious pets? This is such a common it's funny, all through the years I've done these Q&A, and this is always, always the top of the list. Uh, what about my dog? My cat? Cats? No. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to tell you. Let's see, dogs, yes. Next, what is the, I, I got dogs and cats. I know, sorry, cat lady, get out. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> hey, I have the microphone. When you preach your own church, you uh, the, <laughs> I have read. I have read people who talk about do pets make it, as it were, I'll talk about rapture in a second. Uh, but do pets make it to the world to come? My view is, after my study is, I have no idea. <laughs> because the biblical text, in my view, says nothing about it. I've read uh, Mark Lowry's a Christian comedian. He has, has a t-shirt that says, my dogs go to heaven. He lists Psalm something. It has nothing to do. Anyway, uh, so my view is the text says nothing about that, making nothing at all. Um, C.S. Lewis says something intriguing to me, and I love Lewis. He says, it's certainly possible, and I do think it's possible. My view is in the world to come, we will have animals. I think so. I think in the world to come, we will have animals. And our state in, but sorry, I'm going back to Lewis in a second. I'm all over the place. When we die now, if my soul leaves my body right now, and I'm in a spirit state, a disembodied state, remember, that's not the goal of Christianity. Our goal is to get another body again. But in the disembodied middle time state, are animals there? I don't have a clue. Animals would have to have a soul that God lives with them. And maybe they have an animal kind of soul, but not the human soul. Um, In the world to come, I do think there'll be animals for various reasons, but I can't prove that, so I won't spend much time there. But I do think, I think that even cats, I have three cats. I love, um, so C.S. Lewis makes the point. He says, if pets do make it, it's possible that they are redeemed by our making them lovable. Like we have been made lovable. We've domesticated our animals in a sense. It's like may God's grace flows to us to them to make them more like us, frankly, they're more like us. We were in a store the other day, and we are leaving the gas station, and one woman had a little baby dog in the gas station, walked around. They walk them and push them on carts, like next level. Um, I don't need Bible verse for that, but someone might do that. I don't know. Someone might, Becky. You might know someone who does that, Becky. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, but he says when we were taken up in the rapture, this is a very long story. I do not at all believe the rapture occurs. Rapture, uh, I say a lot more about this in a study on Revelation. So on Facebook, on Ch- Hill Church's Facebook account, you can see a study, a series, of pastor study on Revelation I did. It's not Revelations, Revelation, and it's about five or six parts. And in one of those videos, early on, I talk about rapture. Rapture is from the, huh? 
and YouTube. It's also on YouTube. Thank you, son. It's also my podcast. Rapture comes in a Latin word, word, Latin word rapturas, uh, which means to be taken up. Uh, the New Testament's not written in Latin, so that's a made-up word, a Latin way of saying something um, like what Paul says in 1, Thir- 1 Thessalonians 4. But to say this real short and sweet as I can, I very much believe with Paul that Jesus will return bodily and that Christians, the New Testament teaches, Christians will, as it were, meet him. But the vision that Paul gives in 1 Thessalonians is someone, a royal figure, who's coming into town to establish his kingdom on an earthly existence and all the royalty get to meet him first. So Paul encourages the Christians at Thessaloniki, don't be scared, don't be worried. Your dead loved ones, God's not forgotten them. When, when he comes back, they'll meet him in the air as he comes down, as it were. It is not a picture of as he comes down to take them away. That's not in Paul's view. Some go to Matthew that say it's one was standing there in the field, one was not, one disappeared. That's not rapture either. He's quoting from, you. anyway, that's a long story, but I had that video. Uh, so I do think we'll see him. I do think he will come back physically. Uh, but the concept of rapture, the, the guy who taught that, John Nelson Darby, he believed that the church was basically kind of a, not a mistake, the church, as he called it, was an apostrophe. Darby believed that the church should never have been there. Had the Jews done what the Jews were supposed to have done, the church wouldn't have had to come. So Darby believed that God's at the end of time, God's got to get the church out of the way to do what he really wanted to do all along. I fundamentally disagree with him, and I think Paul did too in the early church. So if that's too confusing, I'll say more. And again, I've got it online. So we will be raised from the dead. He will come back. Uh, I don't share that theology that the church is somehow kind of like a side plan B mistake. And we have to get out of the way. I don't think so. Your precious pets. Hope to see him again, Becky. Uh, what is the beast and the mark? Of, well, I'm going to pause. you have any questions? I'm about to run out of time. Any questions? I have some more I can read. But let me take one from the audience because I have some more. Yeah, sorry, I saw Linda first. If I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. Is that okay? Yes. Great question. So the Trinity exists, Father, Son, and Spirit. Before the Son was born, Jesus, did he have a human body? Christian theology historically has taught the answer is no. That the second member of the Trinity, we call the Son, S-O-N, he took on flesh. And so the Latin word to take on flesh is incarnate, incarnatio. So he incarnated. That was unique in the history of existence. So the answer is no. Historically. I mean, that's, that's my view, too, is that... Uh, the son did not have a body until he came to earth. Uh, that's right. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Good question. So when we see our loved ones in heaven or the world to come, will we know them when we have the bond on earth? Uh, um, I do have very much a view on that. The New Testament doesn't say almost anything about that topic. There's some, I think, some implications to, uh, to certain texts, but I think the text says almost nothing about that. I do think, so the answer is, I think the text does say yes implicitly. But I'm more firm than that, and that's because they've had, they've done study after study after study of people who have died and come back, and one of the number one features of the so-called near-death experience, it should be, should be called that, it should be called short-term death experience, because they die, their soul leaves their body and they come back. One of the most prevalent commonalities across cultures is that they see dead loved ones. They meet dead loved ones they didn't know existed. They will meet children who died in utero. They didn't know, mama never told them. Who are you? I'm your sister. What? This happens all the time. People, all the time the evidence demonstrate that. Uh, I find that overwhelmingly improbable that they're making that up, that everyone, because it happens. They'll say, they, they have, well, quick story, they'll say things like, um, you can, I'll give you some books if you want to read about it. They'll have, say, a person in the hospital, and they have a heart attack or something. They'll wake up and say, I made it. I'm so glad you made it. We were praying for you. Oh, good. And I met Aunt May. Aunt May, May well, no. Well, she's down in Florida. How would you meet? Oh, no, I met her. Come to find out she had died that morning, and no one knew. And they met Aunt May, who had died. And they, oh, yeah, and they found out later on they did. They died. They had 30 minutes before you, you had your heart attack. That stuff happens all the time. All the, so I do very much think so. Very much. My, we miscarried. Our third child miscarried. And oftentimes me and Lane will do that. We'll say, we have three babies. And we do. And I can't wait to see him or her. 
and give him or her name. We have some names picked out. One story of a kid who met his sister who died. He didn't know. He came back and said, Mama, did you have a sister? Do you know that? Um, and she said, what? And he goes, what was her name? And she, he said, I asked her, she said, you, you never gave her one. So I really do think that. I really do think that, in fact, I'm convinced of it, that you'll meet loved ones. They will know exactly who you are. Uh, will spouses know each other? And in that sense, if you will follow up common question is, what if I'm married? What if I have multiple spouses? And which one will I love? That's not heaven to me. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of you, but oh, my ex is living. <laughs> heaven, hell, please, wherever they go. Uh, so uh, Jesus explicitly teaches about this in Matthew. Uh, the Pharisees come up and say, well, the Sadducees actually, yeah, yeah, Jesus. not all the Jews believe in a resurrection body. And they come up and say, yeah, yeah, whatever, dummy. Let's say a woman's married, then he dies, marries again, he dies. he got seven husbands. In the world to come, whose will you be? And Jesus lampoons that and says, you fools, you don't know the power of God or Scripture because when you are in the world to come, you are like the angels, neither married nor given in marriage. The assumption, the time period is that marriage is to have babies. And so we do not procreate in the world to come. So will I know Elaine? Yes. Uh, will I love Elaine? Absolutely. Will it be based on romantic love? Absolutely not. I will only have agape love for her, which is what I have for her now. I also have romantic love, eros love. I've got two loves for her. And she's the only other human being I've got eros love with. I, a lot of people get agape love, like my children and so forth. The only if she has eros love, erotic, romantic love. In the world to come, that will go away, and I'll have just agape love. That's so sad. Not to me, it's not. I think it's pretty awesome. I'm done with that. I know, honey. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> Good question. So I'm convinced. That, yes, Daniel. Yeah, very good point. I wonder if someone's going to bring that up. Uh, Daniel said, uh, I keep talking about the New Testament but not the Old Testament, and how does that relate And certain people who go back to the Old Testament don't know whether to apply it or not. Is that fair enough? to? How do I address that? That's right. So one of the reasons for shorthand, I keep saying in the New Testament, is because just for here is to save time, is because certain things aren't even mentioned in the Old Testament, like heaven. That's never mentioned in the Old Testament. They don't have a concept of that. Everybody goes to Sheol. Everybody goes to Sheol, not heaven, hell. Elysium, it, you just go to Sheol. It's not until the New Testament we have this bifurcation, and that's why I said in the New Testament. So sometimes it's shorthand to say it only shows up in the New Testament. Uh, to answer your question briefly is, how do Christians know, uh, this is the way I would say it, not to put words in your mouth, uh, how does a Christian know what is morally binding on a person today? I'll say it one more time. How does a Christian know what is morally binding? What not everyone, but many Christian thinkers through the last 2,000 years have concurred with this belief, and that is what is morally binding on the Christian today is, first and foremost, did Jesus teach it? He's the absolute. If Jesus said to do it, you do it. If he said don't do it, you don't do it. The second thing is, did the early church say do it or not do it? You follow them. Third, did the later early church say it? I haven't got to the Old Testament yet, right? Because that's it. That's it. That is, Christians only find anything in the Old Testament morally binding if Jesus or the church went back to the Old Testament and said, yep, still keep doing that one, still keep doing that one. And we find there are many things in the Old Testament that they did not do that on. Jesus never once, for example, went to Leviticus and say, you've got to make sure your rituals are pure and your sacrifices are right at the temple. Never said a word about it. Well, that, there goes all Leviticus, basically. Not all of it, but... I mean, he quotes Leviticus 19.18 to say, love your neighbor as yourself, but that's it. That's from Leviticus 19.18. Good, go do that. That part's morally binding. When he says, love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, yep, he's quoted from Deuteronomy 6.5, so do that one. But everything else he doesn't quote or cite, I don't find morally binding. That was under the Mosaic Covenant. I'm safe through Jesus, not through the Mosaic Law. So good question. Good question. The, I, I find that very persuasive. That's how I live in my own life. I start with Jesus, or the church, and so forth. Any other questions that we have? I, have got, I can go back to my notes. Anybody else? Yes, sir.
That's a great question. I've asked that, yeah. So does the Bible teach us to bow our heads and close our eyes when we pray? No. Good question. No, it doesn't. The Bible does not teach us to bow our head and, and pray. Uh, that comes from a few things, but if I can be a little, I'll do a stretch and say, there's some degree to which I would encourage it. I, well, I would encourage it for two reasons, but you don't have to. And Jesus never said to do it. One is because the Hebrew word and the Greek word, the Hebrew word for worship, uh, zakar means to, uh, literally means to, to bow down. It literally means the Latin word just to get, uh, you know, genuflect. But anyway, you'd bow down. So it's a body motion. Now, why would I do that? It shows deference. It shows that you're above me. I'm, you know, you know, we do if I bow, same thing. Um, so for me, that I like C.S. Lewis here, that what we do with our bodies can affect our theology. Right, it does. So if I, if I talk to my wife and I'm going, I love you, it's different <laughs> from me saying, baby, I love you so much, I'm holding her hand. It's very different, right? And so if I go to God, I'm going, God, yeah, you know, uh, like, uh, and I'm kind of, and I'm talking like I'm talking on Twitter or something, that doesn't make any sense. But if I talk to him, my head bowed, it tells, it reminds me and my body, get in the right spot and frame of mind. Uh, but do I have to do that? No. Mm -mm. And why do I, and so the, that's, one is, I would argue there's some biblical precedence that worship means to bow down. The other is much more functional, and that is when I bow my head, deference, and I close my eyes, it helps me concentrate. That's it. It helps me focus. It's the same reason why when I talk to people, uh, I don't have my cell phone all the time. Or if I have my cell phone, I'll say, hold on one second, because I want to look them in the eyeballs. I want them to know I'm, I, you've got all my rapt attention. That's how I feel with God. And it's hard for me personally to do it with my eyes open. Because why? My brain's always working and some danger radar is going off. What's that? What's that? I just want to be able to focus on him. So good question. No, we don't have to. You don't go to hell if you have your eyes open. Uh, good question, but no, I, I do encourage it. Hat, good question. The hat, no. The Bible never says you have to take off. That's right. That's no, a good one, though. Uh, those, I'm going to be all the time. Take your hat off. I'm like, where is that in the teaching of Jesus? I have to take my hat off or he can hear it. I, I disagree with that. I, I don't find that persuasive. I can be just as sincere. Wearing a hat, not wearing a hat. I know some of you, no, David, I was always raised. I respect that. So if I'm in a culture, if I'm in a church or I'm in a culture where you take it off because everyone around me thinks I'm a rebellious punk and I hate Jesus, if I don't take my hat off, I'll take my hat off. I've been to ball games, football games, national anthem. What are you supposed to do? Take your hat off. I've heard people cuss people out. Take your They don't take their hat off. I disagree with that passion. But in that culture, to have that kind of, okay, it's a simple thing. And if, if that helps me share the love of Jesus a little more, I'll take my hat off. But doesn't mean he didn't hear my prayer if I had my hat on, that's for sure. If that's Johnny's stock, man, if you don't hear your prayer, I know he lives with a hat on. I think there was two. Yes, sir, one second. Hold on, Joel, yes. Very good question. So, like, for example, in the 1 Corinthians sermon series we just finished, uh, I've got to put the last one online. I was on vacation, but it's all online if you see that on YouTube, on your app, go to sermons. You can talk what he's talking about. Paul does seem to assume that Jesus will return in his lifetime. But like in 1 Corinthians 15, like I said, when he says, and when we who are still alive hear the trumpet, we will be changed. Not y'all will be, or one day, hope, they'll, but we will be changed. Uh, Paul does seem to think it's going to happen in his lifetime. Uh, and scholars debate that forever about exactly what to do with that. And so one answer is to say Paul's just wrong. He was just wrong. You say, but then why was he, what, and you might say, like I said, where did that belief come from? The scholars give different answers. I, I, my, after my research, the answer that I find most impressive is we don't know. We don't know for a uh, for, for reason why. Because we don't have any indication that Jesus told Paul, I'll be back soon. I just got the impression that I think, I, I, my own view is, I think this is pretty common in scholarship, Paul's view, he was so convinced that the world to come was breaking in. I, I use the analogy of like a thunderstorm, it's starting to sprinkle, you know the storm's coming, he's being sprinkled all over the place, and he knows that because people's spiritual gifts are bursting forth. And for him, speaking in tongues, prayer, forgiveness, baptism in his name, healing in his name, these are signs of what the Spirit's doing. But here's the deal. Jews believe that kind of outpouring of the Spirit would only occur at the end of time. 
Why do they think that? Because of Joel. Joel said, in the latter days, I will pour out my spirit. That's exactly what the earliest disciples quote in Acts chapter 2. So for them, they go, the proof's in the pudding. It has to be the latter days because look at the churches. Everywhere I go, the spirit's changing people's lives. It must be the end of time. If it's the end of time, he's going to be here any second. So that's my view is it's a corollary. I think they looked at Christian experience and their Joel, their Bible, and said, it's got to be. It's got to be any day now. That's my view. That's, so that's the best I got because we don't have clear indication. I asked a New Testament scholar who recently died. He was top notch. He came to one of my schools years ago. What's called the delay of the parousia. Why is he not coming back? And why do the early church, what do we do with that? And I, I Howard Marshall, British scholar, he gave a great analogy. He's in the early church, we see in the New Testament documents, uh, and only in the New Testament documents, we see this idea they come up right to the cusp of the edge. Jesus is about to come, about to come, and they come right to the edge, and they turn. And they walk along the edge all the time. So it is true that at any time it could show up. Like any time I could fall over, because I'm right on the edge all the time. Uh, it's really stuck with me. That's a good analogy. It's a good picture of what I think they believed. But if Paul did believe he was having his lifetime, he was mistaken if he did. Yes. And we're out of time, but I take a few more minutes. I'm your daughter. You're my daughter. Good. <laughs> Who's my favorite child? <laughs> He's not even here. Yeah. The, I'll tell you the truth in front of everybody with all sincerity. You are absolutely my favorite daughter. <laughs> I'll say this last thing because we're out of time, unless you want to go for really three hours. Uh, what I was saying this to the end on purpose. Well, a few things. Okay, real quickly. One person asked, what is the beast and the mark of the beast? Uh, you want to hear that one? Or another one is, why do bad things happen to good people? Beast. Okay. The beast. Uh, what is the beast, the mark of the beast? The beast is, that's a reference to Revelation. And in Revelation, particularly chapter 13, again, if you go to the Revelation study, I talk about this. In Revelation 13, uh, John the prophet talks, he has this incredible vision, and he uses an image that Jews knew, especially those kind of authors, apocalyptic authors. They went to two places in their Old Testament the most, the most, oh yeah, to talk about what's going to happen at the end of time. And those two places were Daniel and Ezekiel. And both in Daniel and Ezekiel, they have these visions at the end times of kingdoms rising up and the character of a beast. So John in Revelation 13 blends those together. One, it sounds kind of like Daniel's version, and it also sounds kind of like Ezekiel's version. And these beasts, basically every scholar agrees, the beast is a metaphor for a kingdom of people. And each beast has a head, which means a leader or a ruler. We might say king. And so in uh, Revelation 13, this beast comes out, and this beast in that time period would have been in Rome, and this Rome has his head come up, and then he has... And you have to bow down, and everyone will be killed unless you have the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast in Revelation 7, 13, uh, historically has been translated by most people, is what number? Yeah, 666. That's probably not right. It might be. They found a Syriac copy of a manuscript several years ago, and the, it probably originally said 616, just, just down the road from the address from the original Satan. We're just down. He's close. 616, but they mean the same thing probably. Because um, 666 in Hebrew, but in 616 in Latin, it means Kaiser Neron, Caesar Nero, Nero the Caesar. And so it's a, it's a pictorial, metaphorical way of saying that this end time kingdom that's represented by Rome, Nero is the epitome of this bad guy who's against Christians. And at the time period, he was. He killed a lot of them. He, he burned them alive on stakes in his garden. Nero did in AD 70. So he was a bad guy, a real bad guy. And so the idea is that if uh, that's the image. So the, the mark of the beast for them would be a religious tattoo. And they did that all the time in the ancient world. They, had, they would have tattoos on the arm to show their favorite god and so forth or they were a soldier. And then um, it's also, the second thing is, in other places in Revelation, it says you'll have the mark seal of God on your foreheads. So this is his, John's way of saying, the mark of the beast is the opposite of God's mark, which is to say who you identified with. That's all that means. So I don't find it persuasive at all. It means it's a computer chip that goes in your arm or it's the Nazi concentration camp numbers or it's the visa or your cell phone. I don't, I don't find it persuasive at all. I think it's a metaphorical way of saying that people who bow down to foreign enemies of God, 
you, you'll make it. If you don't and you're a Christian, they will cut you off. And that's what we experience in every culture and community around the world. Uh, whenever the government goes against you, you've got to decide. And that's one of Revelation's chief theological points. You have to decide. You either go in with a government and its culture or you go in with Jesus. You, you can, and when you have to decide, you have to decide. But if you don't bow down, you have the mark of the beast. You're not bowing down, affiliated with him. You won't, it won't work out for you. You have to be ready to die for that faith. And I think he's right, very much so. So and I'll say a lot more about that in my study on the studies. The last thing is, if, if, is it okay if time will say this? Why do bad things happen or do you move on? Is that okay? Okay, if you don't like it, y'all can, there you go. I mean, if you're in a hurry, uh, go for it. The last thing is, uh, very briefly, why do bad things happen is the question is to innocent or good people. Uh, a few reasons. Uh, and this is the one, again, I just got this like a day or a day and a half. I thought about putting every reason on the screen, but if you'll just trust me, because I've done a lot of research on this, uh, the short answer is it depends. So why do bad things happen? And I'm going to say the question is, let me say a few quick things about this. Uh, one, when you say, what is a bad thing? Well, bad is whenever I suffer. The next question going to be is, why is suffering bad? That's a good question for Christians to ask. Why is suffering inherently bad? The answer is no one thinks suffering is inherently bad. If I go see Dr. Tim and he says, man, you, you're out of luck. You need to pop that shoulder. And I go, boy, that hurt. I don't think that suffering was inherently bad. I think he's a bad guy. But I don't think, no, I don't, right? I know for a fact when I had physical therapy on my shoulder, that was for redemptive purposes. It hurt a lot. I had adhesive capsulitis. And they had it, oh, it hurt. But I wasn't mad at anybody. I didn't think it was immoral that they were causing me this suffering. I did it on purpose. I went, I paid people to stretch me and cause me pain. So that's not bad. What really comes down to is what people really mean is, why do people suffer when it doesn't seem like they deserve it? Or they didn't ask for it. I asked for that physical therapy, but why if I didn't ask? Someone just grabbed me and yanked me down and started yanking my arm around. That hurt. And I would say, why? Why are you doing that? In that case, there are two kinds of bad things in that sense that come across. One is the bad or suffering that's caused by evil, and evil is always comes from free willed individuals. Most of the suffering, the badness that people don't like in life, come from evil choices. Most experience of suffering and badness people experience in life come from other people's evil choices. Pause for a second, let that sink in. If Russia not attacked Ukraine, would they be suffering that bad suffering right now? No, they attack them. Where is God? Well, he's on his throne. When evil is called, evil only is caused by free will individual choices, God does not make people do that. They're not puppets. They genuinely have the capacity to choose good or choose evil. He, gives that, he loves us so much he gives us freedom to do that. Most of the badness in life. So if someone cuts me off in traffic, if someone steals my wallet, if someone, they did it. If someone punched me in the face, they did it. Where was God? He was there on his throne. Why, why are we mad at God when they chose their free will to do that? The other kind of suffering, the baddest one, is when it comes to natural disasters, like tornadoes and hurricanes and so forth. If an earthquake hit and the, you know, the roof fell down, it happens at churches. People, the churches, people die. Then why would God do that? Well, some people believe God causes the storm, and he causes tornadoes, and he causes he caused Hurricane Katrina. I heard people on, online on TV back in Hurricane Katrina, they said that was because God hates the gays. And he sent it, all the gays in New Orleans. I fundamentally disagree with that. But that is a view that God deliberately punishes people through hurricanes and natural disasters. I don't find that persuasive. Um, I think that what we call natural disasters, we don't care at all if they happen. They have out in the wilderness. How could he let these worms die with that tornado? All the lovely worms. No one cares unless you get hurt or someone you love gets hurt. Right? Because then we say they don't feel like they deserved it. But natural, what we call natural disasters are disaster because they cause pain or suffering. We're back to that again. Why is that bad? Well, natural disasters or natural occurrences happen in our climate. Why do hurricanes happen? Because it's nature's way of cooling off the earth. Heat energy builds up in the ocean, and to cool off the earth, it redistributes that heat energy to different parts of the planet and cools it off. So the same waters that killed all the people in the floods of Katrina drop probably, I don't know, a billion gallons of water down the soil, and they drank from that water, probably still are. They got all the way down to the cisterns, built up the underground cisterns. That same water that killed people helped birds and fish and wildlife thrive for years because of Katrina. Well, we don't like it because we suffered. That's true. I, I always end with this last thing, or begin and end there, and that is um, 
a fundamental misunderstanding that most people have, and it makes me sad. It makes me sad when I surface this own belief too. At our core, most people in my experience really do think that if God is good and he loves you, he, wouldn't make, he would make sure you don't suffer. Let me say it a different way. If God really loved you, he'd make sure you only felt pleasure. That is not what Jesus taught. The New Testament, Old Testament never, never teaches that God exists to make sure you're happy. See, we're not God's pets. He didn't buy us. Oh, look here, give them all the supplies they need. Ooh, ooh, they're hungry. God doesn't exist for you. We exist for him. So when we get that theology right, realize God doesn't exist to make sure I don't ever suffer, it really lets him off the hook of a lot of things we're mad at him about. If that's true, David, then what, why does it exist? Because he's trying to shape you into the image of his son. And sometimes the only way to do that is to cause or to allow immense suffering. Raise your hand if you've ever learned more about Jesus because you suffered than when you went through a good time. Okay, there you go. That's one of the reasons, and that's actually in the Bible too. That's one of the reasons in, in, in James and also in Hebrews. There's a lot of reasons I can list biblically, but that's one of the main reasons why. So when you let go of the bad belief that God wants to make sure you're a little pet and you're always happy, that's what non-Christians think, and some Christians do too. I'm encourage you, please let go of that false belief. Let go of that. God does love you, and you can, you can make it and trust him through horrible suffering in life. You can trust him. He's good. Can I end on that and say a prayer for us? Is that okay? Because we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being so good and for being the reason why we have hope. I'm thankful that in these incomplete answers, you have all the answers. I'm so thankful that you've got it all figured out when we don't. And that in the world to come, that we will understand in full. We see in a mirror now dimly, indirectly. We're so thankful that when we see you face to face, we'll get it. God, we confess, and maybe I just mean confess for myself, maybe someone else can relate to this, that there's so many times in life where our relationship with you has been bad because we blamed you for stuff that was never your fault, where we blamed you for things that we kept you at arm's length, as it were. <sighs> Please help us not do that anymore. Please help us fully accept the fact that you're good and you're loving and that we can trust you no matter what. We can trust you with what you do with our pets. We can trust you with what you do with, uh, when bad things happen to us. We can just simply trust you. When well, we don't understand exactly to apply a biblical principle or not, we think that we can trust you as the imperfect, ignorant people that we all are, that you give us the grace to keep us going and to grow up into you. And we love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.